Okay, welcome to the July uh, 2024 OpenZFS leadership call. Uh, so right. to kick us off, I think, uh, Tino, you had a couple of uh, items you wanted to go through? Yes, of course. Should I begin? Yes, please go ahead. So there are multiple, multiple things I wanted to know. Uh, maybe we, we start with the second one, the OpenZFS Wiki. Uh, there are a lot of uh, users there, and I think some of them are not uh, on, on this Wiki uh, on, for, for a long time, I think. Maybe yes, uh, uh, I know Matt uh, put uh, down to maybe some uh, around 20 or maybe 30 users, I think. Uh, it's not uh, have ha has to be done also maybe this would be okay because uh, maybe security reason and so on yeah i know matt went through and reduced the editor permissions on anybody who hadn't contributed in a while uh specifically because there was some spam that he was fighting mm -hmm. uh but yeah there might be a couple in here that we can you know there's a lot of people that haven't uh done anything since like 2013 or whatever uh, maybe, maybe but yeah i think the permissions when, have been clamped down when when someone contributed something these are okay everything else maybe just throw them away and, and all users which contributed in the last uh, five years or something uh, these will be there then maybe it's just an idea yeah uh, if somebody wants to spend time on that i'm guessing it would help but uh, I do know that Matt reduced the permissions to prevent some of those accounts from, uh, you know, mm. being compromised and, and used to uh, mess up the wiki. Mm. Uh, I, I am administrator of some wikis here in Germany. Maybe I could do this also. Uh, then we can talk. Uh, no I think uh, one idea might be um, is like, let's come up with what you think is a smaller list. Like, if we just start there, come up with what we think is a smaller list of people that are, you know, kind of still yes, around, still active, and then, you know, um, then, we, you know, work from that angle. That, I think that sounds good. Yeah, I, I was just looking at the list. There are quite a few that uh, have not been around for a while. Yeah. I'm not on the list currently, because I also contributed nothing there, but maybe I would, and... Uh, this time I, I, I have looked at the list and there are a lot of users there, oh, <laughs> but, but nobody is fighting anything. Uh, I normally, each user in uh, Wiki fights also something. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sure like, you know, if, like, if this is stuff that, you know, you said you, you do some stuff in, in Germany, like I, I would imagine like this would be a great place for you to if you're interested to kind of help out like <laughs> i don't yeah, think anybody sure. will turn you away mm -hmm. i can help with this uh, if there is a need uh, just tell me I, I will do it no problem yeah i think it's a good idea and we'll look at getting the, the permission sorted out for that uh so that you can go through because yeah i think i don't know if there's a way to easily do it in the wiki software of, of making a version of the special page that's sorted by the like last contribution time instead of the account creation time um but yeah, I'm sure there's a lot that we cleaned up here to both increase the security and the usefulness of the wiki. This is possible. This can be done. It's just mm -hmm. some SQL. Yes. Yep. So then the next point uh, by me was a state of trim support in FreeBSD. I think there is trim support. I think, but uh, the CTS uh, explicit uh, excluded this currently. Uh, you can take a look into uh, the file I mentioned there, the setup uh, corn shell script, and it's explicitly named not supported uh, on FreeBSD currently. Uh, I was a bit curious. That is surprising. Because, uh, yeah. yeah, like in the, the Illumos times, FreeBSD had its own version of Trim, but since OpenZFS, it's been the same version. I hadn't tried uh, to, to just uh, remove this, uh, but also this check, uh, we, we can... Uh, I, I, I got in touch with this uh, script uh, because I'm, I'm working on the Q Q EMU uh, tests for mm -hmm. Linux and FreeBSD, and uh, there I 
I've seen this, yes. Hmm. Just wanted to mention this. Uh, okay, maybe... so this was back when there was no hole punching, but I think all of that is is solved in FreeBSD now. Then maybe uh... you have to move this, work unsupported, and try it. <laughs> Yeah, and like it even has kind of below the plot where they've just log mm -hmm. unsupported, it has a test to actually check if the disk supports it or not. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so I think just removing that first one would be enough to get it working. I can do a pull request for it, no problem. And then we, we may try we'll see um, what the CI says. Yeah. And the CTS uh, will test it, of course, with the QEMU uh, trim is also tested there. <laughs> Yep. That's the first point of me uh, as a request for command on my uh, pull request with the QEMU tests uh, for Linux and FreeBSD. Maybe we can take a look together on it. Uh, I don't want to tell a lot of the, this. Uh, so the sample run is also uh, within the link, and you can see there uh, what, what things need to be done on FreeBSD, of course, uh, for getting through without red light. Currently, nearly everything is red. It is everything. Well, should, should I, I share my screen for, for, for showing this thing? Or I don't know. Uh, is it's, there specific feedback that you're looking for? Um, yeah, if, is, is there something more needed in, in the summary, for example? So, or is it okay how it is done currently? Or should something be added? Should, uh, of course, uh, I, I currently have only FreeBSD 13, 14, 15, and uh, then I'm a Linux uh, 8 and 9, CentOS. And the other ones are there, but uh, disabled by default. But, but if someone wants to test Debian 11 or Debian 12, then it's also possible without any problems. Okay. So I think it's not uh, draft, it's, uh, but I can't change the state draft. Uh, it's ready for review, I think. OK. Yes. We can start looking at that too, then. So I think the next item, uh, Pavel, was this yours? Uh, asking about when should BRT be re-enabled by default? No, it wasn't me. OK. Do uh, you have thoughts? So I know there was, a, on the freebies, the, there was one uh, last problem where we were checking uh, the file size limit twice. Once in the freebies, the specific function before we were calling uh, ZFS clone range. And then in the ZFS clone range, we were checking the file size limit again. And the first one was bogus uh, because we were checking this against S size max. So uh, you can use S size max in clone uh, copy file range. Uh, and we were checking against this, I think. So uh, I don't, I know that um, uh, Mark was going to handle this one. Okay. So this should be, I think this should be fixed. Is, is it what uh, uh, was found on later cluster update? Or yeah, some yeah, yeah. that's the one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one more PR I recently found just by code review and then later reproduced and right now open uh, when some simultaneous clone and write wasn't happen. Uh, handled properly, it caused some crashes. Uh, I don't have uh, PR open right now, but it was, oh, yeah, it wrote me right now, but it was uh, open a few days ago, past week probably. So if somebody could take a look on that, would be good and have it merge it. Mm. Can you paste the link somewhere? 
Not let Where, me find uh, it. Or I will find it, no worries. Uh, other thing I wanted to ask about is we currently, I think it's every third meeting or every fourth meeting, whatever we do this call at the earlier time. Um, but yeah, this time maybe a bit of an exception because of the problem with the meeting link and so on. But in general, the earlier call seems to have less attendance, although we, we actually did okay today. Um, how useful is having the alternate time slot versus just consistently using the, the time slot we use most of the time? Do people have a, a preference one way or the other? I have no preference. Okay. It's, it's simpler than just one time. Yeah, I know in the, the past there were some uh, requests from somebody uh, in, you know, uh, Eastern Europe or whatever that having the meeting at a more uh, approachable time was good, but it does seem to generally have much less attendance and uh, the people who requested it aren't active anymore. Uh, so I was wondering if it made sense to standardize back to just always having the same consistent time. Uh, but this will go out in the recording and, and maybe we can get feedback from others as well. But um, so what time exactly? Yeah. Like Like today? So, yeah, today is the unusual time, and the proposal just go to the the normal time where we do it. It's what uh, one p.m. Pacific, which is four p.m. Eastern, uh, which is when we've we do like three quarters of all the meetings at that time, and then we occasionally have this one that's early. This time is is probably better for Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. The other one is uh, ten p.m. Right, so that yeah. might be. A bit late for some. Uh, yeah, I think so I'm mostly we're just interested in how many people from Europe are actually interested in joining the call live. Uh, I am from Europe. Uh, it's okay. I'm 10 o'clock, no problem. Right, but uh, yeah, we're definitely interested if anybody else uh, is would find it useful to keep having that early one. But like 10 a.m. Pacific. Is that too early for people? It's uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, right? Yeah, yeah. but for example, like uh, ah. if we could do it like 10 a.m. or mm. 11, right. this is uh, 7 or 8 in Europe, 7 mm -hmm. p.m. or 8 p.m. I think it's... Yeah, so maybe we can do slightly less extreme so that everyone. it won't... Uh, yeah, maybe it won't hurt the attendance as much. But yeah, if people want to either in the document or uh, on the OpenZFS Slack, just would like to hear from more people about uh, if it makes sense to just standardize on the one time or to keep having an alternate time, but like Pavel suggests, maybe adjust it slightly to make it uh, more likely that we'll continue to get people, uh, more than normal people able to join as well, so that uh, we can make the most out of these meetings that we have once a month. Um, I guess we still haven't heard from Brian Bellendorf lately. So, do we have? Uh, does anybody have any newer information on when we're going to cut the two point three release? Like Alexander, you were the last one to talk to him about it. Do you know what the plan was, at least? Uh, I don't know. I haven't heard much from him for last month since before mm -hmm. his vacation. I am all waiting for him to get back and uh, be able to review. Some patches like uh, completed fast dedupe that's mm -hmm. waiting for a month. Also, uh, later I added here to the topic uh, some of my PR about memory pressure. I'd like also somebody's attention about Linux uh, VM integration. Well, on that part, it's slight, slightly improvement, not dramatic, but somebody who is closer to more with more experience on uh, Linux side. Uh, and after that, uh, obviously, Direct IO is hanging for a while. I've done some uh, looks through that. Uh, may do some more look, but uh, I, I'm not sure it's completely, that's completely done science. I suspect there could be some issues with uh, DDoP and uh, Direct IO between those two. And, uh, mm -hmm. but it's also pretty close, but I don't know whether we're gonna include that or not. But fast dedupe, I would definitely like yeah. to see him. 
And we all, we'd also like to see it uh, as soon as possible since we target Trunas release on about October. And before that, we would like to have something stable. So I'm all, all waiting for him to return or uh, I, I saw Tony Hatter started some look on uh, block cloning of the block cloning, sorry, about on the fast dedupe patches, but obviously it's a big beast and Tony told he's not very aware of the code, but at least I saw him commenting some things. Yep. And then I guess we don't have Dexter this morning, so no update on the conference stuff, um, but maybe you can uh, post some more information about that on the Slack when he sees this later. Uh, Don, did you want to talk a little bit about the ARC teardown, especially with the what you found since last meeting? Uh, yeah, it was actually very interesting because we, and uh, I'll back up. The arc teardown is basically when you do an export, um, it used to inline do the evictions for both the L2 and the um, L1, but you don't really need to do that. So for HA scenarios and other cases, it's it's better not to do that teardown inline. So that's what this pull, pull request does. But there was speculation about like, well, what, what happens if you re-import the pull while uh, it's still tearing down. And it turns out that since we introduced the regood function, um, that we're, we're key in the, the GUID that we're using is just a random number. So basically um, all the blocks uh, become orphaned as soon as you export. And we have this async teardown. There's no connection to any any pool in the future, so. Right, so every time you import a pool, the GUID used in the arc is the key is random it's specific to that number. import session. Yeah, and so and what was missing actually though was uh, any guarantee of uniqueness. So I added that in the the second commit where um, we guarantee that there's no there's no pull using that good when we bend out the random number. So yeah, so, uh, it's, so it, I guess that means that takes care of the case of having to worry about the pool coming back because it'll get assigned a different random good. Yeah, in all cases they're they're just essentially orphaned. So there's work to be done, but nothing mm -hmm. in terms of reuse of, of those buffers. So if, if I can get a second eye, I, um, I was hoping, well, looks like George dropped off, but I'll, I'll ping George to see if he can look at it. Mm -hmm. It's um, fairly straightforward, but it'd be nice to have a second pair of eyes. Yeah. Uh, hi, Tony, I saw you joined, uh, are you with us? Hi guys, I'm here. Uh, we were just wondering if you had, uh, <clears throat> if there's anything you could share about the plans for the 2.3 release and the, the timeline for that. Uh, well, I know we wanted to get it out this summer and we were hopefully waiting for the direct IO patch to get in, but I know they've, they've been working on that a lot. So I don't have any specific timeline. Unfortunately, we would like to get another point release out, uh, probably, or at least open a PR for it like this week or next week uh, to support the, the newer 6.9, 6.10 kernels. Direct IO doesn't really require, I think, any on disk changes. It could be merged maybe sometime in progress once it's done, sometime. Uh, fast dedupe science it's uh, on disk change would definitely need to be in before release or it would have to be delayed and that's kind of done for some time I, I, I saw you were doing some reviews some minor ones but if we could somehow accelerate that process I understand that Brian is busy but I don't know what can we do about it yeah um, I'm talking with George Wilson and hopefully he'll be able to review uh all that fasty dupe stuff for us uh and that will maybe make it a bit easier for brian and tony and i had some comments on uh, one of the dedupe patches um that i think are still outstanding okay yeah we'll take a look at those two then
And then I saw, Matt, did you want to talk about the Linux memory refresher patch? Yeah, uh, I use a few months again uh, back. I was mentioning a problem with a newer Linux kernel using multi-gen LRU, and science it's it's in cases when Arc takes most of RAM when we what we have in master of ZFS kernel tends to drops dramatic parts of Arc like half quarter sometimes all just as much as it can, and with my conversation with Yu Zhao from Google. Uh, there seems to be going some workarounds, pretty small ones. I've put a link. Hopefully, they will lean, they will land in upstream Linux at some point soon. They are already somewhere in review, but I haven't seen any updates since them been pushed. I just hope there will be some progress and they will land. Hopefully, with that, it will not be as bad with MGLRU enabled and maybe slightly improve situation when it's disabled in our case. Uh, he promised, uh, or at least was going to look on some way uh, to allow third-party memory consumers like ZFS to integrate into a kernel LRU mechanism uh, outside of Shrinker. Science Shrinker is kind of always will be second-tier uh, mm -hmm. interface, definitely not a primary one. So he was thinking about some way to for third-party consumers to register some amounts of memory they use just sort of accounting i use it this much memory call me when you need to reclaim those something like that and that way it will be integrated into general lru and hopefully will uh, create even pressure between zfs and uh, page cache that should solve a lot of problems but obviously it's a bigger project and with zfs being out of three it's hard to be uh, prom promising anything in that area but uh, he mentioned same problems should apply also to graphic uh, drivers, developers. Mm -hmm. They also have memory pressure and maybe from that front uh, could be more progress, more pressure, but we'll see where it ends. Meanwhile, I mentioned maybe it's last time, but here is again, uh, I, I'd like somebody aware of uh, Linux memory pressure, but not necessary. I created a patch just trying to slightly be more fair uh, to the kernel uh, about memory pressure, wait in more cases for eviction, not to return prematurely, and uh, try to handle more cases. I can't say that I have too much test result, but changes look reasonable to me, and uh, I'd like somebody to take a look and uh, see what, if there are any thoughts about it. So I think it's Simple and uh, easy, but just obviously not an easy area. Yeah. Because we st even still on uh, Trunas, after we uh, disabled multi general review, after we set uh, ARC uh, eviction limit or whatever it is to zero, we actually that's another problem that needs to be addressed. I'm not sure if we are ready to change it to zero, but in my understanding, anything other than zero is ugly hack that cannot work properly. It it has to be dropped to zero if not just if would just kernel work reasonably and don't ask us to drop all the arc at once from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but even after doing all that, we still see some out of memory issues or own killer killing things left and right if we don't have a swap on the system. That's why I hope that that PR of mine should slightly improve the situation. Science home killer should wait for ZFS actually to do things to free memory and ZFS should be more cooperative about it. So mm -hmm. I, I, it's not a big change, not dramatic, I think, but still it should be way in the right direction. So I'd like to, for people to take a look. Okay. Anyone have just as, thoughts or comments? As, yeah. Just otherwise, we may see it problem much more, much bigger one since people start using ZFS master in anywhere in production. It took us some time until we started hitting those. Like, you know, proportionate number of users that may be not dramatic, but it's painful enough to be annoying when it happens. Yep. 
Uh, next on the agenda, somebody had a question about creating clones from channel programs. Yes, um, this is actually coming in from the users meeting. We've got one of the users who has this kind of as a pain point. He wants to be able to do that in a channel program. And at least all of us in the users group, um, it kind of seemed like a, uh, a bit of a one of those things where it seemed just like an omission, some, some, mm -hmm. it didn't get looked at. And so we were wondering why that might happen or why that may have developed that way. Yeah, I assume it was just that it wasn't one of the ones that was added. I don't know that there's a specific reason it wasn't. Um, and I think it's relatively straightforward to add. Uh, I know back when channel programs were brand new, I was talking to Matt about the uh, the concept of a recursive rollback. So applying a rollback to multiple data sets at once. And he suggested a channel program for that as well. Um, so yeah, as far as I know, there's no reason why creating a clone wasn't uh, an option there. I think it was just that it wasn't one of the interfaces that they needed when they were developing channel programs. And so it just never got connected. Okay. I just, I kind of wanted to know that what that was so I could, um send that information back that mm -hmm. direction. Thank you. Uh, do you know if somebody's interested in writing the, I think there's a little bit of C and a little bit of Lua that we required to, to connect it? Um, the person asking is Jan on mm -hmm. the BSD side, and I will ask him. Okay. Uh, but yeah, if they don't want to write it and create a pull request, then maybe at least uh, creating an issue there and, uh, that's maybe a fairly reasonable kind of junior job for somebody or a nice hackathon project for somebody new, especially if we're going to have maybe more user type people uh, staying through into the hackathon at the conference in a couple of months, uh, collecting all the kind of things you could do in half a day projects like that uh, would be great. Okay, I will, I will convey that information onto him later this week. I'm sure he will be thrilled to hear that. Great. Um, there's an other item here that somebody added about having a problem where after a uh, unexpected reboot or power failure, they're being told that their pool uh, should be destroyed and recreated. Does anybody know what this is referring to? Yeah, I don't think Google captured uh, who added this item. Um, in a maybe somewhat related uh, point, we're uh, at Clara. We are working on some tools to to help uh, recover files in in cases like a damaged directory and so on. Uh, and they might have a little bit of of stuff to upstream from that coming up in a bit. But uh, beyond that, uh, I don't know. what the best way to kind of advise users when they run into situations like this. Um, I think giving them a list of things to try is probably a bad thing to do, uh, just because without understanding what, you know, extreme rollback and things like that actually do and, and what the trade-offs are, they're probably not in a very good position to decide uh, to start performing operations like that. Um, we will also be upstreaming some changes soon uh, around Zpool clear and just the way ZFS handles when uh, a pool gets suspended or when, when too many disks go away at once. Uh, and so that maybe will will help with this situation, although it sounds like this one is uh, possibly a single disk VDEV. Uh, and yeah, I'd be interested to know more about what ZFS thinks is corrupted uh, and why it's recommending that the only way forward is to destroy the pool, recreate it, and restore from a backup. Uh, because just a power failure or reboot shouldn't uh, result in that message in ZFS.
Um, <clears throat> were there any other topics that people wanted to raise today? Um, Pavel, have you got much review on your hierarchical rate limits? Well, I'm the bottleneck now because uh, I'm in, uh, currently in Poland and it's hard for me to find some time mm -hmm. to, to finish it. So, uh, but uh, I allocate the time to join the call. So that's that's a plus. Yes. So hopefully, uh, I will be able to uh, get back to it soon. Uh, yeah, I'd want to finish this as well. So <laughs> hopefully. Uh, is there anything else that's outstanding or that uh, we should use our last few minutes to talk about? I think that covers pretty much everything from the agenda. Yeah, we covered the BRT, uh, the meeting to schedule, the 2.3 release, uh, the CI improvements using QMU, the wiki, prim support, and the tests, uh, async arc teardown, the Linux memory pressure, and the channel programs. And hierarchical bandwidth limits. Oh, uh, the one other one that if anybody might have time to look at, uh, we opened a pull request for zpool scrub dash capital C, uh, which basically uh, scrubs everything that's been written since the last scrub completed. Uh, so basically, it uses the the transaction ID of the last scrub that's finished, uh, and basically scrubs everything that's with a birth time between that and now. Uh, it's basically the the one of the chunks of our original uh, older pull request to do scrubbing of arbitrary ranges. Uh, so this gets the, the bulk of that in. And then uh, we're still working on a way to kind of keep a, a round robin database or something of transaction uh, ID to wall clock uh, so that people can ask for you know scrub files that have changed in the last you know, X uh, time frame, but uh, that's still under development. But the um, kind of scrub everything that's changed since the last scrub uh, is a nice clean pull request that just needs a couple of reviews and it would be ready to land. Also, from a sort of announcements so early pre announcements, uh, we are no, uh, we are looking on possibility to do block cloning for the walls. And there are some patches floating in Linux for several years to support XCopy for disks uh, through the VDF queue. And uh, we're looking to integration that with uh, ZFS to support block cloning, at least within one Z wall. It doesn't promise to block cloning between the walls, but at least better than nothing we have right now. I haven't seen patches yet, but hopefully something early should be. Nice. That sounds like a great extension to block cloning. Oh yeah, it still you... depends on, on upstreaming of uh, Linux patches first, but we may use it in Trunas before that, but we'll see. I wonder if it would be useful to have a way to uh, to have like alternative ZFS clone that use block cloning to clone ZVOL. So simply just copy and reference all the blocks. But without uh, keeping the origin and right, so it's it's still a standalone data set. It's just like a thin copy, basically. Yeah. yeah. There can definitely be advantages there because just you don't have the same kind of, I guess, cost that you get with uh, when it's a clone, and then you if you want to get rid of one of them, then you have to. You know, deal with promoting and moving things around and the snapshots being tied together versus when they're block cloned and separate, it kind of more similar to a hard link where, you know, just once the last copy goes away, it goes away. 
Uh, we have a, a platform internally for developers uh, where we uh, uh, where you can just deploy our product in, in FreeBSD jail. And I was initially I was hoping to use ZFS clones, but it quickly gets really messy with trying to maintain all the snapshots and trying to be able to remove any Older. data set. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I just ended up with copying all the data when I need to duplicate such an instance. Um, so something that doesn't have those shortcomings of clones would be nice. For five system would be harder probably, but for Zvols it might be much easier. Yeah, because Zvols is all one object. Yeah. And so you can kind of do that consistently. I guess maybe with a file system, even you could probably make it work as long as the source is a snapshot, right? Yeah. But this is um, what you would basically do is would just do CP A or something similar mm -hmm. and just rely on copy file range underneath. Yeah. Yeah, that could definitely be interesting for Zvols. Also, uh, I had this tool. I have it somewhere in my GitHub. Uh, uh, it was called file, file Rewrite or something like this. Uh, so the idea was that if you want to change like compression algorithm or something similar, uh, it just rewrites the file in place. And of course, it uh, it's racy. Uh, uh, that's obvious, uh, but I was wondering uh, because I know that Solaris at some point had man uh, mandatory locks, mandatory file locks, uh, which I guess you can lock a file and you cannot open the file unless you get the lock, uh, which would allow to do more operations like this on live file systems, including maybe just doing like this. Uh, manual the duplication with block cloning that you could just go over file system and find uh, same blocks and just clone them, clone them in place without worrying about traces. Uh, I also remember uh, that Solaris wasn't happy with this uh, mandatory locks, but I'm not sure to be honest. Yeah, I somewhat related, we've been looking at a way to kind of force an active pool into a read-only state uh, or mostly related to recovery. Like if a pool suspended, instead of resuming it with Zipool clear, we would kick it into a read-only state. Um, and it's kind of raised some of the similar questions about kind of the ability to, to freeze a data set so that you can do things to it uh, without it moving and, you know, kick user space out of it uh, so that you can get all the locks and make sure nobody else is touching it in the meantime. Uh, and I wonder if that might kind of fit together with that. I was thinking of, well, I also was thinking about similar problem, but slightly from different degree, uh, not from the change in compression, but uh, from changing uh, data locality between, uh, from one VDF to another, like rebalance pool, defragment pool, and things like that. And I was thinking towards uh, creating some syscalls, IOCTL, whatever, uh, to, it's practically make uh, ZFS take range lock on a file or part of file do per block whatever operation requested practically read write ideally without even decompression decryption just read raw write raw whatever and mm -hmm. then drop the lock uh, and yeah that we are thinking about that but not exactly close but yeah there was it's on our radar Back when Delphix was first working on uh, device removal or device evacuation, they had a, a sub command for a little bit that would like rewrite uh, a data set and basically force it off the indirect VDEV to the concrete VDEV. Uh, and I think if the interface around the, the locking there could have been solidified that that they might not have given up on that. Uh, so yeah, I think that providing some interface like that so that we can 
Exactly. Saying get a range lock so that we can keep other people from messing with the file while we can do stuff. We can end up with a, a non racy version of something like what Pavel's talking about. No, I mean, the range lock literally mm -hmm. exists in ones we have right now. It wouldn't be mm -hmm. anything new. Right. It was just uh, a way to kind of drive that from outside ZFS, right? Yeah. Via yeah. like a but IOCTL. I, uh, I actually thinking about uh, data move. Uh, no, uh, from from evacuation standpoint, it doesn't work for with VFS, with VFS layers. That's why it has no idea about range lock. Maybe that's why it would be a problem. But if we call it directly per file from the VFS layer, we could take locks natively, and it wouldn't be any more complicated than cloning or normal normal read write operations. Uh, it's only a question: uh, What should the API look like? Uh, is there a chance? OS may already have things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, uh, we just uh, had this interesting issue. Uh, it's uh, it's a difference between UFS and ZFS. So uh, imagine you have read-write file system and you have some binary. The binary is running, and uh, you delete uh, the binary of the program that is running, right? So uh, it cannot free uh, the blocks yet because uh, there is still reference and, uh, uh, and the blocks won't be freed even though the, the file is no longer in the directory. And now you remount the file system read only. So UFS will complain. Uh, you won't be able to remount the file system read-only. Uh, if you do it forcibly, the binary will crash because the blocks will be freed underneath, right? Because UFS is trying to protect against uh, that once you remount the read-only, you don't want to modify the file system. So you, it wants to free the blocks before uh, doing the read-only remount. But for ZFS, it works. So you can delete the binary. You can uh, remount the file system read only. Uh, and is the that binary because ZFS is already separately keeping its kind of unlinked queue and so on and knows we'll be able to track and be able to free that space later to avoid leaking it? Or is it, and, and UFS doesn't have that? Or is it that actually yep. ZFS is going to end up leaking it? So in case of ZFS, it's probably that uh, the file system from the user perspective won't be modified, but the pool will be still modified once the uh -huh. binary right. Uh, stops, right? But maybe if uh, you won't be able to remount the whole pool read-only in this case, mm -hmm. but it's it's interesting difference because mm -hmm. uh, one would could argue that uh, you shouldn't be able to remount read-only if... Uh, there is some modifications uh, still waiting. But in ZFS, those modifications are going to be at like the DMU, not the VFS layer. And so, yeah, it's not, yeah. it doesn't consider that. But still, I'm not sure about like uh, how it uh, works with Zeal, for example. Right. It, and I guess even can... the difference between the file system being mounted read only and the data set being set read only. Yeah, so I, will, uh, I think I was setting data set read only. Okay. Because, yeah, even that is DSL is still even above the DMU, right? And so it still technically works. But it's interesting, like, for example, we still need, like, zeal entry to free those blocks, or, or maybe not. Now, the zeal entry is for file removal. I'm yeah, sure I think the freeing of the case. blocks is that like the dead list is only for snapshots, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, I'm not sure does what it just end up going on the case. the background freeing list? No idea. Yeah, I guess yeah, it's a good question. Where does ZFS track these kind of pending freeze? That yeah, it's not actually background issuing the free yet. So it doesn't go in the, you know, Z pool get freeing, but 
it's kind of waiting around for the file to close to actually mark those blocks as free. Because I'm pretty sure uh, I'm pretty sure that ZFS wouldn't allow you to open a file for writing, deleting the file, and then remounting read-only while still keeping the file descriptor open. I think that would be uh, not allowed. Mm -hmm. But with binary, which is being executed but not written into, it allows to for the remount. So I don't know. It's a bit mm -hmm. sketchy. So yes. Yeah, I think that's uh, one that'll be interesting to follow up on. Yeah, so just to fill some time <laughs> we have left. Well, on on that point, your the uh, concept of doing a copy of a ZVOL, I know also will be, I, I've heard some discussion of that from uh, the user calls as well, somebody wanting that at least one person. So you're not alone in, in that. It's already being discussed wider. The way, uh, is it possible in Linux to mount the same uh, file system uh, under multiple directories read-only? Is that like natively supported by VFS? Does anyone know? That you have multiple mount points, but it's... I, I think I heard something about it, but I don't know details. There were some discussions lately, I, I remember. But some issues somewhere. It's like null FS mounts, but without using null FS, just mounting mm -hmm. the file system in multiple places. Okay. Yeah, anyway. I'm not sure on that one, but I think... Uh... Like Alexander was saying, I vaguely remember hearing something relatively new to make that an option. OK, uh, thanks, everyone. And I'll get this video over to Matt. And when he's back from vacation, he can get it posted to YouTube. You guys, bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.